Uh, today, we're going to be talking about building large-scale transactional data lakes with Apache Hoodie. My name is Nishat Agarwal, and I work as an engineering manager at Uber, and I'm also an Apache Hoodie PMC. Um, something I wanted to share with you guys is uh, Apache Hoodie recently graduated to an Apache top-level project um, from an incubating project. Um, I largely work on problems in the data world, uh, such as standardized ingestion, schematization, latency, uh, and data lake primitives. Um, I've marked a couple of other blogs that may be of interest. If these slides are made available, uh, I would encourage you guys to check it out. Okay, so before we you know, talk about you know, all the details, uh, let's try to understand what does data lake even mean? Um, so data lake is defined as a central repository uh, that allows you to store uh, all kinds of data, uh, whether unstructured or uh, structured at large scale. Uh, so you store data as is, uh, which is a one-to-one -one representation of the data that you would have uh, produced at your source. And then you can run different types of analytics at it, uh, you know, build dashboards, uh, do visualizations, and, uh, and also make better business decisions uh, by machine learning. So uh, to understand you know, how to build a data lake and why do we need it, uh, let's talk about some of the canonical requirements of a data lake. The first requirement um, is around incremental database ingestion. Um, so think about, uh, you know, you, you have a business and, you know, the business has a bunch of microservices uh, which are talking to um, your business entities and storing high value data in a database, um, something like MySQL, right? Um, so you may have, for example, user information, uh, which is uh, present in, you know, in your, in your MySQL database. And, you know, some of the information may be user ID and country ID, last modification time for this user. So the one way to you know, have this data represented on a data lake for analytics is to do bulk loads. But bulk loads generally don't scale because um, it adds a lot of load to the database. And it does a lot of wasteful rewriting uh, because only a few records may have changed over the last few hours, uh, but you end up uh, you know, rewriting the entire data set anyways. The second requirement is uh, around deduping log events. Um, so think of uh, you know a, a retail website uh, which produces a lot of impression events. Uh, think of clickstream data, um, and what you want to do is you want to replicate this clickstream data onto your data lake. Um, and there may be multiple reasons for you to do this. This uh, particular type of uh, uh, events are very high scale, uh, probably order of several billions or even trillions a day, uh, which results to you know hundreds of millions of uh, events per second. Um, and what can happen when you're trying to replicate these events onto the data lake is you may uh, end up seeing duplicates uh, due to client retries, or you only have an at least once data pipeline. And the reason why you want to dedupe is probably because you want to do some kind of counting on these events um, to understand you know, what is the dollar value that is generated by a specific ad, for example. Um, or you want to make sure that your data is highly, highly uh, trustworthy and uh, you know whatever you count is actually what happened at the source. So you want to you know you want some way to be able to dedupe these log events on the data lake at large scale. Um, the next one is around storage management. Um, so uh, you know many different uh, distributed file system implementations are used for uh, building your data lake. One of them being HDFS, um, which is what what he was initially built on. Um, and so HDFS has a problem of small files uh, because of uh, the single metadata system that has to store all the information. So that stresses the file system, so you don't want small files. But if you want big files, uh, writing those big files takes longer time, especially if you're doing, uh, uh, if you're storing your data in file format such as Parquet. Um, and finally, if you took an intermediate approach of writing small files and then stitching them into big files, um, there is no standardized way to do this. You would have to develop your own like mechanism to do this. Um, and also, the, the small files are anyways leaked to the queries, which can cause some sort of query degradation. And this also causes a lot of write amplification, given you write the data and then you write it again. Um, the next requirement is around scaling uh, you know, the distributed file system. Um, what are the guarantees that we want from a distributed file system? Um, so you want to be able to so any ingestion or query on a distributed file system will ask uh, the file system, hey, what are the files available in a particular folder? And then you want to go and list it. This could be single-threaded versus multi-threaded in parallel, depending on what kind of distributed file system you use. 
Um, especially with some specific file systems, you don't have appends in some cloud storage. Uh, in S3, um, listing is eventually consistent, which means once you write it, you may or may not get the exact contents back. Um, and then, um, you know, there are other like gotchas such as large directly listings are very slow. So how do we get around scaling distributed file systems? Um, the next requirement is around transactional rights. Um, so we all use, uh, you know, databases such as MySQL or cloud stores, um, um, which provide, uh, you know, asset semantics. But what does it mean to have asset semantics on the data lake? Um, so the, atomic, the atomicity is about publishing the data. Uh, when you're ingesting this data, this can fail midway due to multiple reasons. Um, and what you want to show to your users is either everything succeeded or nothing succeeded at all. Um, consistency is about being able to serve only valid data, and any uh, invalid data is, is rolled back. Uh, you also want isolation, and in this case, we talk about snapshot isolation, which means that you could have concurrent readers and writers, but the readers only see data which was committed at a certain point of time, and old readers continue to see older data, new readers see new data, and so they have, they have snapshot isolation. And finally, you definitely want durability because um, you don't want any data loss. Um, the next requirement is, okay, we build, say we build our data lake um, and we build our raw tables. Uh, what about derived tables? What about other consumers who want to consume these tables, do joins and build new tables? These are generally multi-stage ETL DAGs, uh, you know, very common in batch analytics. Uh, generally, you know, uh, takes, it takes in a reason large amount of data because they're probably reading from like tens of tables. Um, a good example is, say you have a raw table, which is you know, a table about payments, and the payments is in many different currencies, and you want to standardize those payments in some sort of a standard amount uh, currency, and you want to build a derived table out of it. Um, right? How do you keep this data in the derived table fresh? Right? Do you pull the entire data? Can you do checkpointing? Uh, what field do you choose to do checkpointing? Um, and there are many scaling challenges. How do you do these recomputations? Right? How do you do window joins around the, uh, all these tables. So there are many challenges that uh, plague uh, derived tables, some of which are similar to raw data, such as scale, and some of which are not. Uh, the next requirement is around compliance and data deletion. Um, you know, with uh, data being you know, something that um, is of importance to everybody, uh, you want strict rules on data retention. Uh, you want to be able to correct data. You want to be able to delete data. Uh, and you want to do it everywhere, not in your, you know, sort of unstructured and structured data, but also in your derived data. Um, and and how do you do that? How do you do, uh, you know, efficient deletes in, you know, petabytes of data, uh, where deletes require index lookups, uh, but at the same time uh, you want a scan performance uh, on a columnar basis, and those don't, uh, they're quite orthogonal when you look at it at a fundamental level. Um, so how do we solve this problem? Um, so summarizing all of these, uh, you know, you want incremental database ingestion so that you can ingest change logs. Uh, you want to be able to do blog events, scale the distributed file system, um, apply these operations for all your data sets, whether it's raw or derived, and be able to do compliance uh, uh, and not at the cost of scanning uh, performance. Um, and finally, like, you know, uh, given the nature of like data ingestion, you can have like late data, which is incoming. How do you handle that? What if like an, a row was updated, which is coming in late? How do you handle those kinds of late arriving data? So that's that's about data lake. Um, but how can I build a data lake, right? Like you need some sort of a data platform to be able to build a data lake. Um, so data lake is just part of the problem. You you want peripheral tooling around correct collecting data. Uh, you you want dynamic evolution of your static data on the data lake so that you can actually efficiently use it. Um, you want monitoring of performance, a pattern of ingestion. Uh, correctness is crucial, so you want data observability. Um, you want to maintain, like, how do I maintain multiple technologies, right? Like stream and batch. Uh, these use cases and maintaining technologies are cumbersome. How do I make make sure I get around that? Um, can all so the question is, can all of this be managed through a unified system? Um, so let's look at the requirements of a data lake, a data platform, right? So you want managed ingestion. Um, essentially, it's hassle-free data ingestion. Uh, and ingestion of data has many challenges. You have many different types of sources, such as Kafka, upstream databases, raw file dumps, all these kinds of different sources. Um, you want to auto-scale for spiky traffic and for organic explosion and growth. 
right? And you want to be able to get high quality data, um, which uh, which is usable, um, and and so you want to uh, apply schemas to your data. Um, and how can I do schema management then? Um, and essentially, uh, when you build data downstream, how do I transform this data on the fly during ingestion or later? Um, how can I uh, apply custom business rules, uh, which you may want? For example, you have an incoming data and you have data already present. Uh, your business may want to merge this data for counting purposes, for example. How do I apply those kinds of transformations? Uh, and finally, how do I provide data observability? Uh, you know, without being able to get insights into performance and correctness, um, you cannot maintain this kind of a system. The next requirement is, uh, okay, now I always hear about stream and batch. Uh, and, you know, how do you unify these? Is there, is there a reason to unify it? So typical Lambda architecture, you have batch, which is great for slow-moving data. Uh, you know, freshness of the order of tens of minutes. Uh, you can correct any, any anomalies that you stream, see from your stream style data. And stream data is great for sub-second latencies, freshness, can have errors, late arriving data, but you can treat batch as your fallback plan, right? Um, and storage needs are slightly different. Stream processing data needs some specialized DBs, maybe as sync or state stores, and are mostly row-based. Um, you could write uh, columnar-based with stream as well, but Batch is like a very uh, pref like a preferred approach to write like columnar data like parquet. Uh, slow to write, but great for scanning. Um, so is is there uh, so Kappa architecture talks about more about you know unifying processing, uh, but what about use cases for storage where you actually care about one to five minutes uh, you know data latency, um, and you want uh, you know data to be in your data lake um, whether it's scan performance or uh, ingestion performance, and you know, the next requirement is uh, we talk about write once and read many, uh, but ideally you probably want to write more than once, but not many times. And that's because you want to adapt your data lakes. Um, you know, typically data lakes are write once, read many, but you're stuck with the initial data layout. Uh, they may not be best. Over time, you may realize that, you know, your query pattern is actually very different from what your data layout is. Something that happens very uh, commonly in uh, database modeling. Um, and then, you know, you may have inefficient scan queries because you may be aggregating on time uh, and actually accessing data based on user ID, and this ends up spanning many different files leading to degraded performance. Um, and so the concept is, can you reorganize your data based on your needs? Um, but also at the same time, it's non-blocking, which allows readers to continue and the business to continue uninterrupted. Um, uh, so you do this asynchronous, asynchronously. So, so, the, so the question to ask is, this data layout and query pattern have a strong connection? And if they do, what can I do about it? And so at this point, I want to introduce the Apache Hoodie. Um, so Hoodie is a basically uh, you know, a framework uh, that allows you to do all of the things that I talked about, about before. Uh, it lets you, uh, you know, build your ingestion pipelines um, and write them into you know, tables, which we call as Hoodie tables. Um, or you can, uh, you know, chain hoodie tables uh, by having upstream hoodie tables and build downstream hoodie tables, and this fits well with our derived data sets model. Um, and so, uh, the, uh, and, and then you can query these tables via your favorite like engines, whether it's Spark, Presto, Pipe, Impala, um, and then you can build either interactive query dashboards on it, or you can in build incremental data pipelines. Uh, and obviously, you can use both of these systems to do, you know, build feature stores and machine learning. Um, and then there are three different types of views that uh, Hoodie exposes. Um, one is called the incremental chain streams. Think of it as a, as a Kafka stream of uh, data, but on your tables uh, in your distributed file system. Um, uh, then there is columnar read performance, which is like you know, your pure native uh, columnar performance from Parquet or ORC. And then real time uh, queries, which are more about like, can I ingest really quickly, uh, but at the same time get like good read performance. Uh, and obviously, uh, in the bottom, you can use any pluggable cloud store, um, which is basically DFS compatible. Um, so a hoodie-based data lake would look something like this. Um, you have an upstream you know, bunch of raw events coming in. Um, you stream them through a queue system like Apache Kafka. Um, and then you could use an out-of-the-box tool called Hoodie Delta Streamer, uh, which is basically a mini ingestion framework for you to be able to set up your ingestion pipeline in a matter of minutes. And let's say you want to run that at a you know a cadence of like two or three minutes, and you're able to provide five minutes freshness onto your uh, onto your data lake. And here in this case, uh, we're talking about let's say HDFS. Um, and so it's like you know you have your uh, data on your data lake, and then you want to expose this uh, data to different uh, different types of systems which uh, which want different types of 
uh, latencies and, and and query performance guarantees. So incremental queries is more about, okay, how do I build my warehousing tooling by knowing what change upstream? Uh, Real-time queries, maybe you want to power like dashboards in like less than five minutes. Um, and then obviously you want to do time traveling for uh, building, you know, your feature stores or you want to do columnar read performance queries. And those are, uh, you know, very popular for, uh, you know, exploratory analysis, data science, machine learning. And finally, Hoodie also exposes, you know, metrics, uh, pluggable metrics into uh, to provide observability. Um, and also in the future, uh, with what we're working on is being able to adopt, adapt your layout based on query pattern. So um, what Hoodie guarantees you um, uh, is basically what we expected from the data lake, which is the asset semantics. So we provide atomic multi-row commits. Um, we have a special, uh, you know, folder called a Hoodie folder under your table. And we provide atomic multi-row commits uh, by monotonically increasing timestamps. Um, we only expose valid data that's exposed to the queries. Uh, any data that may have failed is uh, rolled back uh, uh, transparently. We provide snapshot isolation using uh, multi-version concurrency control models. Uh, we have concurrent readers, concurrent compactors, and a single writer right now. Um, and finally, uh, you know, our durability guarantees are provided by the commit protocol that we have, as well as the durability guarantees that come with the distributed file system of your choice. Um, so, so summing it all together, you know, data data platform ecosystem would be using you know Apache Hoodie as your storage abstraction, and then you know all the requirements that we talked about for building your data platform. Um, so, and so Apache Hoodie comes pre-built with a managed ingestion framework uh, through Delta Streamer. You can do automatic schema evolution using you know Avro rules, and Hoodie supports our pluggable Avro uh, schema evolution strategies. Um, we, we are talking about like somewhere in between a batch and stream. Uh, we have a unified storage layer, uh, which can serve you latencies of less than five minutes. Um, we, we provide pluggable frameworks like Prometheus, Graphite, um, uh, Datadog for data observability. Um, and then we are working on you know, adaptive data lake for fast, efficient storage, uh, which learn from your query analysis. And all of this, uh, you know, along with obviously the main underlying storage abstraction, uh, that is Hoodie, um, that uh, uses row and columnar file formats, uh, such as Apache, Avro, and Parquet to provide uh, strong columnar performance, uh, read performance, while at the same time keeping ingestion latencies low. So with this uh, background, I wanted to give you uh, a little bit of insight into the use cases at Uber and the scale at which we run, a, run uh, you know, the data systems at Uber. Um, so, so the hoodie at Uber, we, we had about a 150 plus petabytes uh, transactional data lake. Uh, we run tens and thousands of tables every day. We manage tens of thousands of tables, um, and we ingest over 500 billion records a day. Uh, these numbers are slightly older, maybe like a few months old, so uh, may have changed uh, in, the, in, the, in the recent few months. Um, uh, the Hoodie Delta Streamer is an out-of-the-box solution. Uh, one of the, one of the, I wanted to give you an example use case where it is used out of the box. Um, so... Uh, you know, Uber's global network analytics team actually wants to monitor what is happening with the network um, uh, when the Uber app is running. So think about Uber running on 4G, LTE, 2G, all these kinds of networks in different countries. How do we monitor the performance of the app based on the network? Um, so what uh, the team did is, you know, they ingest a bunch of raw events, which are, you know, network events. Um, and then they use Hoodie Delta Streamer to incrementally pull what changed uh, in the raw event uh, transform these entries um, uh, by computing delta results, merge them with what was uh, present before, and finally upset this into a summary table. Um, the, the One of the reasons to do this is because uh, the cardinality of this data can be very large, and so they use T-Digest to kind of come down from a large cardinality to a smaller cardinality um, to come up with an estimation of how the network is performing. Um, another uh, very popular way uh, to use Hoodie is by the ETL pipelines. Um, so think, so we already use Hoodie to store all our raw data, um, and even like you know downstream ETL pipelines uh, popularly use Spark data source integrations, um, and they they are you know many of the ETL uh, you know uh, customers are very familiar with PySpark, and so they use PySpark and Hoodie, um, and then the way they do it is they they have a Hive sort of source uh, where they use Hive queries to incrementally pull this data. And then they use like Hoodie and SpiceSpark together to do similar kinds of collapses, other table joins, and finally upsort that data into model tables. This way, end to end, everything is incremental. 
Um, finally, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the advanced primitives and features that Hoodie provides. Um, so one of the one of the you know wonderful features that we use Hoodie for is recovering from data corruptions. Um, so think about you know running like large scale production systems. Uh, some of the common questions that can prop up are like, what if a bug resulted in incorrect data being pushed to the ingestion system? Uh, what if I marked a column as null where I didn't intend to mark it as null? Uh, can I can I get my old data back? Right? And Hoodie addresses these for you. And there are a couple of ways to do it. Um, the the higher level tool is called Restore, where you can restore the table to a last known correct time. Um, and there are two ways to do this. One is called Save Points. You can just say tell Hoodie that hey, checkpoint my table at different instants of time. And so what Hoodie will do is it will optimize for the number of versions that it needs to store to minimize disk space. Um, the other approach is to just say, hey, can I just store 10 versions of data? And I will always go back to one of these versions of data if, if needed. The downside is um, uh, that uh, you, know, you will need a lot of uh, storage capacity because you're st storing multiple versions of that data. Um, but there are slight differences because save points doesn't work for one of the optimized uh, f formats that we have for Hoodie, which is merge and read, um, whereas uh, the file versions retain works for both. Um, I talked about incremental ETL processing. I just wanted to give you a uh, quick uh, snapshot of how you, how easy it is to write an incremental pipeline. So all you do is you sp you do a spark dot format hoodie, and then you just provide you know a range from which you want to incrementally consume this data. So say uh, the last time you consumed this data was time t, and you want to consume data from now minus uh, time t, and then you just provide that range, and then you give the actual table upstream, uh, and then you can just you know, get that incremental data, create your temporary view, query it, or you know, pass it down to your downstream job. You could do the same thing with Hive. Um, and you just have to set some configurations in the Hive shop, um, or through you know your Hive uh, driver um, queries. And the last one uh, is around time traveling. Um, again, like as you can imagine, uh, since we allow you to move uh, windows uh, for you to be able to read this data. You can just move that window way back and say, "Hey, you know what? Like, I want to create, I want to query an older snapshot in time, um, as opposed to getting incremental data." So let's say you want to say, "Hey, what was the snapshot of my data in between time, uh, you know, t1 and t2?" And then you just provide that range, and you will get the snapshot of that data during that time. Obviously, this comes at a cost of keeping those versions available, uh, so that you can actually go back to that data. Uh, so you can do this with Spark. You can do this with Hive. Um, some other goodies which are probably of uh, a use is, uh, and I don't know, many people may already have, you know, built their data lakes, uh, and like, you know, they still want to use all of this functionality. How do I do that? Uh, so in the last like six months, we've worked on a feature which is which provides easy conversion of an existing table into a Hoodie table. Um, um, so it's very simple to do that. You just spark, start a Spark uh, data frame, um, and then you say, hey, you want to write into a Hoodie format? Give your source table name. Uh, get the op put the operation as bootstrap, uh, and it's provide the the output path where you want to save it at. Uh, and so in the background, Hoodie will just go scan this table, uh, develop all the metadata needed, uh, and will not rewrite your data. It will the data will be as is in the format that you have, as long as it's in one of the file formats that Hoodie supports. Uh, it will just create a metadata which is a skeleton to your actual data, and you will be able to use all the features that, that I talked about about Hoodie. If you're more interested, there's a full RFC around here in the open source community that you can read. Um, finally, um, very quick, uh, you know, about the roadmap. Um, you know, there are some very interesting projects coming up. Uh, I talked about adaptive data lakes, uh, which is the Hoodie 112 project uh, uh, for efficient storage and query performance. Uh, we're so Hoodie right now works on Spark, but we're working towards making it engine agnostic. At which point, Hoodie will be able to run on Flink, and you can do stream-style processing on Batch. Um, and then we are working on eliminating file listing for object stores. Uh, it's code complete. The PR is landing soon. Um, so that's what I had. Um, you know, please, uh, you know, check us out. Um, we our mailing list is very active. It's a budding project. Uh, lots of exciting stuff ahead. Uh, you can reach us at dev at apache.org. Follow us on Twitter. Or just go to the website, you know, try out a quick uh, demo. Uh, takes 15 minutes to see whether that suits your use cases, um, and and you know, talk talk to us about uh, uh, you know questions that you may have. Um, so yeah, at this point, I can open up to Q and A. All right, thank you, uh, Nishad. That was uh, 
that was condensed, but I thought it was so interesting to see what you guys have done with the hoodie. And we had we have a couple of questions, but I'm not sure if you've covered them. I think it was covered already, but I'll go ahead and ask them. Uh, just to confirm, so hoodie was developed in house at Uber. That is correct. Okay. And another question that came in um, is, can your cloud data lake handle complex big data? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Can your cloud data lake handle complex big data? Yes, you can have uh, complex, uh, you know, schemas for your for the data in the cloud. If that, if I'm understanding that question correctly. Yeah. Uh, Cool. And then I just, I actually, I'm curious on my end, how did all of this help your internal team or your internal organization at Uber? Right. So, uh, you know, one of the backgrounds, uh, if, if I can give a quick background about Hoodie, one of the reasons why we started it was, you know, we had these changes that we were consuming, whether it's CDC change logs or Kafka events, and there was no you know, clear way to be able to manage these at a large scale. Uh, while at the same time performing the columnar read performance that we wanted to give. So we started with that, and that's what helped our systems grow, and we were able to you know, provide transactional guarantees on a data lake. So tomorrow, if you want to delete data, update data, uh, it, is, it is very simple. You don't have to do any extra processes around it. You just like pass on that data just as you would uh, to your ingestion systems, and it would work. And then over time, we realized that you know, you essentially, like, you know, the, cloud, like the cloud data lake world, we... You know, you need like tons of use cases to manage like machine learning and different use cases where all of this requires certain guarantees and APIs from the data that's stored on your cloud. Uh, and so, you know, for Hobi specifically, you know, there are these APIs helped us grow into an area where you can now build feature stores on it. Many, many teams do that. Uh, you know, you can manage your data uh, in an asset semantic. You can uh, understand the query pattern and reduce cost of queries on your data lake. Uh, based on how you want to lay out your data. So that's how it's helping us in the future, and uh, and the background is how it helped us, helped us in the past. Okay, awesome. So it did enhance collab uh, collaboration then within the company? Well, yeah, it did enhance collaboration within the company. And um, as you as you know, uh, this is an Apache open source project, so mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of traction from other companies uh, who, who also want to use and have similar problems, and so there's a lot of uh, roadmap for the open source uh, uh, project as well. All right, perfect. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. And if you are sticking around for a little bit, maybe people can reach out to you directly or how, like, would, can they maybe contact you on LinkedIn if they had any questions? Yeah, f feel free to, like, ping me on LinkedIn. I'll, I can hang around as well. Uh, but definitely feel free to ping me on LinkedIn. And uh, the best way is, uh, you know, just if you just shoot a, uh, an email on the mailing thread, I'll be you know, maybe just like you can mark, hey, I watched this presentation and I'll be sure to respond there. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, guys. Bye.